this afternoon. Well, here to answer your questions on the Brexit process, what options are open to MPs, are Dr Catherine Had Haddon from the Institute for Government and Henry Newman from Open Europe. Thank you both very much for joining us. Um, forgive the noise in the background. That's We've fine. been living with it and we'll have to live it for a bit longer, I think. Right, first question from Alexander on email. And I touched on this with Chris Morris, but a lot of people are asking this. What does the Irish backstop mean? And this is central to mm -hmm. Theresa May's problems at the yeah. moment. Yeah, it's meant to be an insurance policy. It's meant to be uh, used only if they can't agree to a deal to make sure that there's this open border between the Republic of Ireland, between Northern Ireland, where trade and infrastructure are able to move freely. And it's meant to try and protect that whilst they work out what the future relationship will be. But obviously many people have concerns that A, it won't be as temporary as they want it to be, or that it will be used in the first place, and also what it means for the future relationship. Will it sort of force us into a relationship that, that people don't want? Henry, that's the point. It's, it's this word temporary. What yes. is temporary? So it's, it's, it's clearly what, what it's billed as is a temporary relationship, but one that lasts until a future relationship comes along. When does that future relationship come along? When could both sides agree? We simply don't know. The Prime Minister said she's trying to clarify some of the terms of the backstop, some of that insurance policy. She's trying to work on that in Brussels. But I think we have to be prepared for the fact that if this deal goes through, we could well end up in the backstop for a period of time. That would mean that we're in a customs union with the EU, so we'd have a free trade zone. There are a lot of advantages of that, but it wouldn't mean that in the short to medium term we'd be able to do our own independent free trade deals. Am I right in thinking that the Norway plan that everybody talks about, but that was signed as a temporary deal by Norway 15 years ago and it's still a temporary deal? Yeah, there's a, so that's a, one of the concerns that in diplomacy often you come up with a temporary solution and it ends up lasting much longer than you expect. But I think it's actually worth thinking a bit about the backstop because it's much less problematic than many people think. It's outside of the single market, we'd be outside the EU, we'd be able to control immigration, we'd be able to make our own rules in many areas of our economy. It's just that on goods rules for Northern Ireland, we'd have to stay aligned. So it's, it gets us most of the way out. And I think a lot of MPs should start to think, let's take the bird in the hand. Let's accept this deal, even if we don't like the backstop. Now, Catherine, one thing that has changed since we went through this all last month mm. is that Theresa May, if she loses the vote, well, she, her own party cannot kick her out. She's made sure that, that can't happen. But uh, Lawrence has emailed this question. If no confidence in the government was called, would Theresa May remain the Conservative leader? Uh, that's a very tricky question to answer, and it partly comes down to her, because a vote of no confidence, if it's put under the Fixed Term Parliament Act, then it triggers this 14-day period. But we've never tried this before. It's new legislation, only came in in the last decade, and people don't know what would happen during this 14-day period before there's a second vote of confidence. Historically, Prime Ministers, if they lose a vote of confidence, are supposed to resign, but they've been able to call a general election. She can't do that, so the question is whether or not she would resign and say that another Conservative should be Prime Minister and should go through that 14-day period and try another vote of confidence, or indeed whether she would try to stay on d during that period. And it's uncharted territory, so we don't know what she might want to do. And we know that Jeremy Corbyn has said he wants a general election. What, yes. would, the, what would that process be? Well, it's, it's reasonably difficult, uh, I think, for the opposition to trigger a general election unless they win a lot of support from the Conservatives as well. So I don't think that's actually very likely. And I don't think a general election would necessarily resolve Brexit. It could well lead to a hung parliament, and you'd have lots of different parties going into that election with different Brexit policies, some of which would be entirely magical. So I think you know, one of the big questions is, if there was a general election, what would Labour's policy be? Would they be campaigning for Brexit? Would they be campaigning for a second referendum? If there was a second referendum, would they be backing Remain or, or Brexit? We just don't know. Right, another question. Cliff, on email, what other issues in the withdrawal agreement, apart from the backstop, are MPs not happy with? It's a range of them. Some are about the role of the European Court of Justice and what that would mean for EU citizens and that the UK would still be bound to those rules. Uh, if, you know, if you're Brexiteer, that's probably one of the big issues. Some is about the money that we would have to give to the EU to, to go through this transition deal. And some, for Remainers, there's, there's other issues as well. Uh, and some of that includes Remainers who obviously don't want Brexit in the first place and so object to the deal from that point of view. But it's important to remember as well, there's a lot of strategy going on here. So there are MPs who think that by opposing the deal, they can manoeuvre things to the way in which they can get the kind of future that they want to have. And that's really what the tricky issue is, of what, are, what is potential, you know, potentially possible for them and are they playing the right strategy to get it. I mean, everybody's confused. I'm confused, I have to be honest, because one minute I'm told bad deal is better than a no deal. Now no deal is, is better than a... I, I, you, you, you pay your money, takes your choice, it seems, depending on what month we're looking at. But, but what, what 
are the options other than a no deal because we've got Theresa May's plan, she says that's it. Yeah, there are two it, options. That's it. So either you've got no deal, that's what you, so putting aside no deal, either you leave with this deal in some form, uh, perhaps with some tweaks, uh, maybe with a different sort of future attached onto it, but basically it's this deal with the backstop which we just discussed earlier, mm -hmm. or you don't leave. Mm -hmm. You have a referendum and you, or you withdraw, Bre withdraw Article 50 and you just don't leave the EU. Well, because David has emailed said, if this is the best deal Mrs May can get from Europe and Parliament rejects it, then surely we have to constitutionally accept that it will be a no deal Brexit. Well, I think it's when Parliament uh, rejects the deal, because I think it's likely that Parliament will, in eight days' time, vote this down. But the government is surely likely to bring this deal back again, perhaps with some changes. And I think what MPs should be reflecting on is uh, Parliament overwhelmingly voted after the Gina Miller case to, to authorise the government to trigger Article 50. That set in train a process where, after two years, deal or not, the UK would leave the EU. Some of those same MPs, including the Labour front bench, who backed triggering Article 50, are now turning around and saying, wait, 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 we don't want no deal, but also we don't want this deal. Well, then what do you want? And I think that's part of the problem we're in, that, that, that Article 50 set in train a process where either you leave with a deal or you leave without a deal. You mean they change their mind? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> you've never seen this well, before. No, no, let's, <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, Philip, on email. Catherine, what arrangements did we have with the EU prior to the UK joining and why can't we simply return to these when we leave? It's uh, The EU or EEC, as it no more, has changed massively. Uh, the kinds of things that it covered then are very different. But the then kinds it was of a trade thing, wasn't it? Was it was a trade thing. Now it covers all sorts of things, all sorts of regulation, uh, all sorts of different aspects of our economy and our relationships with it. And, and the UK was very important in driving those changes, in dr driving the single market. So, uh, and also so the UK economy has changed massively since then. The world has changed massively since then. So no, it wouldn't be the same thing. But but that's part of what people are debating about with these no deal arguments is, is what kind of future would that be and whether or not it would be the sort of return that they want it to be. But but yeah, it's it, not. It's those rose tinted, tinted spectacles. Aren't, aren't, it, the, the, we just can't do it. We, we can't do it at one level, but I think it's also possible to argue that actually the backstop and this Theresa May's withdrawal deal in some respects turns the clock back. It takes us back to an EU which was just a trading bloc. We'll be in a free trade zone with the EU. That's what Eurosceptics used to say they wanted. They said, look, we like the free trade stuff. What we don't want is all the new rules and regulations. So the backstop would keep that free trade with Europe, uh, but also turn off the tap of all the new rules. Stop the ratchet that means that the answer to every problem from Europe is more Brussels uh, and more integration. So in some respects, the backstop and Theresa May's deal does turn the clock back. Right. Uh, Robert, on email. Why, if we've not, uh, sorry, why, if we've been a net contributor to the EU coffers over many years, do we need to pay even more money to the EU? What is it for? This is the 39 billion. It is, and it covers a range of things. Some of it is about, it's, it's basically the commitments that we've already made, and so it's honouring those commitments. But it, it covers lots of things from, uh, and, and some things that the UK will then get money back from in terms of farming uh, money, in terms of money from the European investment banks. So there's, a, there's a range of things that it will cover. And, and even if we left under no deal circumstances, there's a good amount of that money that we'd probably have to pay in some respect. Another, well, now would we? But there, because there's the legal, and then there's the moral there is, argument. There now, is, the yes. moral argument. If you if you talk to Jacob Rees Mogg or others, they say, no, 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 we don't need to pay, spend one penny. Yeah, they, they do. There are also arguments to be made that we could be taken to international court if we don't pay certain amounts of those. But uh, I mean, again, we're in uncharted territory for this. And it's also, again, if you look from the moral point of view, if we left under no deal, we'd still need a range of, of uh, deals with the EU on many different aspects of trade of customs, of, you know, flights, of mobile phones, of all sorts of things. And so, again, you know, not honouring that commitment could have consequences for it, and that's something yeah. that the government would have to consider. Because it would be rather silly to upset the very people that we are then going to be depending on for a future trade deal. Right. I think this... Look, I mean, this, this ship was sailed quite a long time ago, right? We agreed to this Brexit bill, so-called, back in December of last year, uh, the year before last, in fact. Uh, so 13 months ago, we signed up to this. Uh, about half of the money is for standstill transition, which the UK asked for for the best part of two years to keep everything the same once we've left to allow us a bit more time to adapt. The other half, we pay over a longer period and it allows us to actually settle accounts, exactly as Catherine was saying. But I think the key thing is, if we ended up in the backstop, we're not obliged to pay a single penny at all. I've got one final question. This is from Tony on Twitter. Um, I'll put it to both of you right now. When will it all be over? 
No time soon, I'm afraid. <laughs> and it depends, again, what you're talking about. Obviously, we're looking at the 29th of March, and we could see what we're expecting this week to go on week after week after week. It depends how the meaningful vote goes, if we have that meaningful vote on the 15th of, of January, and then it depends what happens after that. But even after that, deal, no deal, we're still looking at a long period of time talking about what the future relationship of the UK is to the EU. Sorry, Tony. There we go. That's the answer to that one. <laughs> Catherine Harvey, thank you both very much for coming and talking to us. That's great.